I'm going to talk about my uh, work uh, here at Cyclarity Therapeutics, formerly Underdog Pharmaceuticals. We recently changed our name uh, just to confuse all of you. Uh, and you can reach me if, uh, if I don't answer all of your questions at my email or on uh, LinkedIn uh, or wherever you can find me. Uh, so let me start by uh, saying that when, when we were launching this company in 2019 and targeting oxidized cholesterol that, uh, that accumulates with, with age in various cells and tissues, I realized that there wasn't uh, really uh, any comprehensive review of the topic in the literature. And so that's where we started was by writing it, uh, which, which shocked me because there are over you know, 200 papers that I consider to be core uh, currently relevant uh, to this field, uh, but I, I think we're actually just hitting an inflection point now where, uh, where this is happening because uh, since we published this, uh, I've seen uh, two other similar reviews uh, out there in the literature. So what happens is you have native cholesterol and it reacts with uh, uh, with an oxygen radical, a uh, oxygen-free radical probably came from the mitochondria for that mitochondria connection to my old work. And, uh, and that leads to aspects of aging. So I'm not trying to claim that uh, oxidized cholesterol accumulation is the be all end all of aging. It's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, it's one toxic biomolecule that accumulates with age. Uh, and it accumulates in, in many cells and tissues uh, uh, that uh, especially ones that don't turn over much with age, uh, particularly microglia uh, in the brain, uh, macrophages, uh, which are all over your body, but I'll particularly talk about those in your vasculature and uh, RPE cells in, uh, in the eye uh, and others uh, that I discuss. And I encourage you to look up my review paper and you'll see uh, almost all of the diseases of aging at least uh, mentioned with, a, uh, with, with some uh, uh, interaction with uh, oxidized cholesterol. So I'll be talking almost exclusively today about our work on atherosclerosis, the biggest disease of aging, uh, but uh, you know other diseases of aging that uh, oxidized cholesterol are implicated in, we're also interested in. Uh, we have a small grant to, to work on Alzheimer's disease, for example, on the same topic. Uh, um, and uh, I hope to have some uh, results to share with you in the not too distant future on that. Uh, to, to summarize some of the important points about oxidized uh, cholesterol, it's not the same as OxLDL. So LDL is the, the lipoprotein particle that carries uh, that, that carries cholesterol from your liver to uh, to the, the cells and tissues in your body. Uh, it's considered the bad cholesterol and um, there's, there's growing awareness of oxidized cholesterol. You can have oxidized cholesterol, uh, inside of oxidized LDL, but you have also other stuff that's oxidized on the, the big uh, um, heterogeneous oxidized LDL particles. So they're not exactly the same thing. Oxidized cholesterol, and I, I'm sort of using oxidized cholesterol and stuff in keto cholesterol interchangeably, uh, is, is completely useless. If you could wave a magic wand and make it all disappear from your body, you'd be just healthier and happier uh, and you wouldn't miss it. Uh, it's broadly toxic, so it's, it's toxic at fairly low doses to any cell that it's exposed to. Uh, and the mechanism by which it causes toxicity is by intercalating in, uh, um, uh, your, your cell membranes. Uh, and the, the lysosomal function in, in particular is, uh, is badly affected by oxidized cholesterol. Uh, it's highly correlated with heart failure. Uh, I'm not going to talk about our uh, and other people's results on that too much, but it's uh, it's really interesting how strongly correlated the accumulation of oxidized uh, cholesterol in tissues in red blood cells uh, is with uh, with heart failure. Uh, and as I said, it's implicated in most diseases of aging. So, uh, like I said, we're focusing for our initial indication on atherosclerosis, which is uh, if you risk adjust, the biggest killer in the world, uh, not just in, uh, in places where we eat too many hamburgers, but in the entire world that uh, uh, depending on, on which um, meta study you believe, 30 to 45% of uh, all death in the world, if you risk adjust the heart attacks, strokes, and cases of COPD, uh, the obstructive uh, lung disease, uh, that are caused by atherosclerosis that are thought to have the primary cause being the, um, the, the blockage of the arteries, uh, then you're looking at uh, this enormous percentage of death that's, uh, that's caused by 
uh, atherosclerosis. So that's why we're thinking big and going after uh, the biggest killer first. Uh, how does atherosclerosis occur? So atherosclerosis is the thickening of the arteries. And so the reduced uh, volume of your artery that is available for blood to flow through, which creates strain on your entire circulatory system. So what happens is you get a fatty streak in uh, your artery and a monocyte is recruited to the lesion. Uh, it uh, invades the, the lesion site into the wall of your artery. It differentiates into a macrophage, which starts eating up all the lipids and other debris that it finds there. However, when a, when a macrophage gets overwhelmed, uh, particularly if you have oxidized uh, cholesterol in there, uh, that inhibits the lysosomal function, the lysosome shuts down, and the cell keeps eating uh, until it balloons up into a fat, ugly uh, foam cell, which is no longer functional and uh, will just sit there uh, essentially forever and become part of the problem instead of the solution. And so our goal isn't just to prevent that from happening, like uh, lipid lowering drugs are supposed to do today, but, or slow it down, uh, but actually reverse it by removing the oxidized cholesterol from uh, the macrophages and restoring them to function. So um, we, we dug way back into the literature and, and tried to think of creative ways to do this. And that's what led me to uh, cyclodextrins. Uh, you may or may not have heard of cyclodextrins. They're cyclic uh, carbohydrates that uh, are, are used for all kinds of interesting uh, purposes uh, through, you know, over the last hundred years. Uh, they're, um, they're, they're individually, uh, you know, in an unmodified form, they're, they're cheap and easy to make. Uh, in the last couple of decades, they've really taken over the, the field of excipients, which is molecules that deliver hydrophobic uh, drugs to, uh, to people uh, in, in, you know, many uh, huge percentages of drugs on the market today contain cyclodextrins in them. So there's a lot that's known about their safety uh, and uh, their manufacturing. Uh, however, using them as, uh, as drugs is extremely limited. There's one cyclodextrin-based drug on the market uh, today, and it's just recently crossed uh, uh, blockbuster status, uh, and, and we're hoping to be the second one. And I think this is just the right time to, to bring this kind of drug to market because uh, of the, uh, the track record of, uh, of safety and, and manufacturing know-how and familiarity with the regulators that, that cyclodextrins have. So we're taking this sort of unusual approach. And what I love about cyclodextrins is how engineerable they are. Uh, and we started out with a, a large amount of, um, of computational modeling to try to understand how cyclodextrins interact with um, uh, sterols, cholesterol, and oxidized cholesterol in particular. And so we did a lot of computational screening, and then we learned how cyclodextrins naturally bind cholesterol and uh, oxidized cholesterol, 7-keto cholesterol in particular, and then designed these new cyclodextrin dimers uh, and uh, and started testing them. Uh, this is uh, from a paper that we published uh, uh, early last year, uh, and it is, it's, it's hundreds of, uh, uh, of experiments that went into making this one graph. So I'll try to explain it. It's a simple assay and it's automated and we run uh, every, every cyclodextrin that we've ever been able to get our hands on through it. Uh, you know, from the catalogs and, uh, and then every new cyclodextrin that we've created. Uh, the important points are that as you go up on the y-axis, uh, we're showing increased, um, we're showing de I'm sorry, decreased affinity for the target. And as you go to the right on the x-axis, you're showing increased specificity for our target uh, for seven keto cholesterol over uh, regular cholesterol. So if you look, uh, the worst uh, quadrant to be in is the upper left-hand quadrant where you have low specificity and low affinity. Uh, over here, you have uh, many of the commercially available uh, cyclodextrins that you can get from the chemical catalog, which have high, some of them have high specificity, but low affinity for our target. And down here on the bottom right uh, is where some of the new cyclodextrin dimers that we created 
our uh, binding with high specificity and high affinity for our target. So uh, after uh, some uh, trial and error and more engineering, we came up with our lead drug, uh, which we're calling EDP003, and started running it through its paces in uh, biological systems. So uh, what, uh, what I have here are uh, some experiments done in, uh, in macrophages, foam cells, and plaques uh, to, uh, to, to show the effect that our drug has uh, in these systems. And uh, here on the left is uh, foam cells that we've um, foamed up with uh, uh, with a lipid mixture containing oxidized cholesterol. And then we show that we can remove uh, large amounts of the oxidized cholesterol by treating with our drug, uh, foam cells. Further, and uh, I think much more excitingly, is if we take actual plaque tissue from a patient, from humans, and soak them in our drug in a dose-dependent manner, we can remove huge percentages in a single treatment of the oxidized cholesterol from the plaque tissue. Uh, now, what was weird is when uh, we looked at the, the initial experiments that were performed over the course of hours uh, or over the course of a whole day, we couldn't see any difference between the time points, uh, which got us scratching our heads because we kind of thought that that was going to be the, um, the, the biologically relevant time period. So then we dropped down into minutes, and at 15 minutes, uh, we found that it was coming to equilibrium. So our drug is acting extremely quickly, which is important to its mechanism of action. Uh, and finally, as I said before, oxidized cholesterol, 7 keto cholesterol in particular, is highly toxic to any cell type that it comes into contact with at fairly low doses. And uh, here we show that we rescue uh, uh, in, a, um, in, in a pretty low uh, dose-dependent manner uh, the, the viability of uh, the monocytes, which are the precursors of the macrophage. Uh, so that, that's exciting, but uh, what is even more exciting is, uh, and, and some of that data that I've shown uh, just here uh, was published already, uh, but what I'm going to show you now is, is all unpublished data uh, on, uh, next on, on functional uh, data on foam cells. So if you take macrophages and grow them in a dish, they, they look like what you see in the upper left-hand corner here. Uh, and, uh, and you look in the upper right-hand corner, this is what happens after we treat them with the lipid cocktail uh, uh, containing oxidized cholesterol. So we can foam cells up much faster than others in the literature do just by adding oxidized cholesterol, uh, which most uh, groups don't. Uh, however, that's, that's not what I really want to crow about here. You can see all these blobs, these red blobs here. This is a very typical phenotype of, uh, uh, of a foam cell. This is, this is basically the definition of a foam cell is that it looks foamy because it has all these red blobs in it. And we can reverse that. Uh, we can prevent it, but this data here that I'm showing you is actually reversing the, the foam cell phenotype almost completely uh, by treatment with our, uh, with our drug, uh, which is something of a first. Well, maybe you're asking yourself at this point, okay, that looks nice and the cells look better, but are they, uh, are they actually feeling better? Are they functioning better? Well, what do macrophages do? Macrophages eat, uh, that's their job. And uh, so this is new and exciting data and we're still uh, testing a lot of different parameters of uh, you know, preventing and reversing and uh, um, you know, sequentially treating, uh, but they're all working out pretty much the same way, which is in a dose dependent manner, we can increase the, the functional capacity of, the, uh, of the, the foam cells, which are returning to being healthy macrophages. So we're really exciting about that emerging story. Um, I, the, the next in vivo data that I'll tell you about is all about uh, safety, uh, and, uh, but you, you guys are probably more interested in efficacy. I'm not ready to talk about our, our work in animal models yet. I'll say that I'm not a big fan of animal models of atherosclerosis. Most of them are, are kind of blunt instruments that uh, are you know, just like knockouts of the ability to metabolize cholesterol. However, other groups with these low potency cyclodextrins have by megadosing animals with sort of um, pharmacologically unrealistically high doses uh, have been able to show quite striking in some really, really great papers uh, uh, that uh, you can reverse uh, atherosclerosis in, uh, in mouse models. Uh, this is the Apoly knockout mouse here on the bottom uh, paper. Uh, and uh, excitingly, out of the University of Arizona from the uh, Doyle lab, uh, you can improve uh, stroke recovery, uh, which is a, it turns out to be an interesting dyslipidemia um, story. Uh, 
but uh, moving back to what we've done, this is a summary of a, uh, an enormous amount of uh, um, safety pharmacology work that we've done in preparation for filing for uh, IND and IMPD permission to go into human clinical trials. And um, to, to sort of summarize what uh, we've, we've seen is that uh, we don't get into acutely toxic doses uh, or repeat toxic, we don't see any acute toxic doses even up into grams per kilogram of body weight. Uh, and in repeat dosing, we can start to see uh, problems up in the, um, uh, up in the, the low uh, grams uh, per kilogram of body weight. And um, if you extrapolate from the uh, various uh, cell and tissue-based uh, assays that I've shown you already, which I know is a stretch, uh, you'll see uh, on this logarithmic scale here that, that we're down in the, um, uh, you know, about a hundredfold lower uh, doses that we hope that our uh, efficacy range will be in when we are uh, treating humans uh, with, our, with our drug. So uh, in summary, our drug's very safe and uh, we're plowing ahead uh, towards, uh, towards clinical trials. So let me summarize our, our plans here. Uh, what we've done so far is we've had four regulatory meetings, uh, three in the UK and one uh, at the FDA in the US. So we've had our pre-IND meeting earlier this year, and we've had three meetings in the UK. So why so many meetings in the UK? Uh, that's because after our first meeting in the UK, uh, they were somewhat impressed with us and invited us to apply for a new program uh, called the uh, Innovative Licensing and Access Pathway, which is available to companies preclinically and follows you all the way through the clinical path. It gives us increased access uh, to regulators for them to give us advice along the way. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, potentially financial support during the uh, clinical trial periods if it looks like our drugs work. So we're really excited and honored to be, uh, to be a part of that. And therefore we're planning our phase one clinical trials to be solely in the UK. And so uh, as, as probably you all know, for the most part, phase one trials are, are only in safe, are, are only in healthy volunteers. You're only looking at safety. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, single and multiple ascending dose um, but we might get to uh, test uh, in, in some of our uh, healthy volunteers in middle-aged patients who have uh, sort of normal levels of atherosclerotic load for, um, for people who are middle-aged but are not yet uh, being um, treated with uh, you know, statins or you know, aren't being, uh, getting surgeries uh, at, on their advanced plaques yet. And so maybe we'll be able to see some, uh, some early data uh, there. Uh, but the real exciting um, study will be uh, starting in, in 2024 when we're able to go into large numbers of patients and use non-invasive uh, imaging to uh, show, uh, to look at the plaque and, and see whether it regresses uh, over the, the course of, uh, of the study. Uh, and, uh, and be, uh, hopefully have that be the main endpoint, uh, demonstrating that we're not just slowing down, uh, the, the worsening of atherosclerosis, which happens to everybody with age, uh, but that we can actually reverse it dramatically. So I'll, I'll start summarizing and, uh, say that we've raised $14 million to date. So we're, we're well-funded and, uh, and very lucky, uh, to have the, the kind of support that we've had so far. Uh, but we're going to need to raise a lot more money uh, in order to go into clinical trials. Um, our, our drug development, our drug production process, which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, going from milligram manufacturing up to kilogram manufacturing is a huge challenge. Uh, but we've solved uh, that problem and we're manufacturing at kilogram scale and we're starting GMP manufacturing uh, within weeks. Uh, and that will also kick off our GLP safety studies in, uh, in animals, which we've already done non-GLP versions of, so we're pretty confident of the safety of our drug. And I've already told you about our regulatory process, and of course, we'll be going to um, uh, back to, uh, you know, we're going for IMPD in the UK, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, eventually to IND uh, to with uh, FDA in the US and, and hopefully to Europe as well. So uh, to, to take a little bit of a step back from the single drug, uh, what we what our vision is that we can target anything that's small and hydrophobic that accumulates with age. And, uh, and so 
but we have this platform for doing that. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, we're targeting atherosclerosis as our lead indication, but since oxidized cholesterol, 7 keto cholesterol is implicated in many diseases of aging, we're interested in stroke, we're interested in Alzheimer's disease, uh, and there's an orphan disease that's a cholesterol transport disorder. Uh, that, that's, um, it's a bit of a long story, but, uh, but could also be a good uh, target for our drug as well. Uh, other small hydrophobic, uh, targets that uh, that we're looking at, um, we're, we're still trying to build that list, uh, and um, uh, and that's all at the discovery stage. Um, since I have a, a little bit of extra time, I'll just uh, talk about how uh, critical the computational component of our screening process is, and uh, and say that it goes through many layers. Of, uh, of screening where we uh, go from molecular docking to molecular dynamic simulations like the, um, the video that I showed you before. Uh, and, oops, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then more recently onto, uh, onto uh, um, uh, PMF, potential mean force calculations, which allow us to predict the actual affinity of a target like 7 keto cholesterol or cholesterol uh, or anything that we want to encapsulate inside of one of our cyclodextrins, that we can predict the affinity, um, the actual binding affinity uh, in silico before we even manufacture it and test it uh, in vitro. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, by saying that uh, uh, we have an amazing team that is, uh, is behind all this. We have fantastic advisors, uh, a, a team which is growing as well. Uh, we uh, have amazing funders, and, and in uh, particular our lead uh, funder, Kizu, uh, which uh, has uh, been a fantastic partner uh, all along the way. So I'll, I'll stop there. And uh, if uh, we have time for any questions, I'll take them. And if not, please uh, do follow up with me by email or social media. Uh, and uh, I would love to hear from uh, all of you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, that's extremely exciting, Matthew. Um, so yeah, there are some questions here. Um, well, first question, and I got a couple of my own, is uh, when is it expected that, that Psy Clarity will begin phase one clinical trials? Uh, middle of next year uh, is what we're aiming for. We're, we're aiming for uh, permission to go into uh, clinical uh, trials in Q2 of next year, and then uh, hopefully starting uh, next summer. Yep. And I got a question regarding the uh, seven keto uh, cholesterol <clears throat> levels. So um, is, is it currently used as, as, a, as a biomarker for um, uh, in humans, so much, much like HDL and LDL levels? Um, is there, are, can that be measured to see if as a predictor it, it, sh uh, it should be, but it's not used widely. It's used in some research labs uh, like mine and, uh, and a few others around the world. The challenge, uh, I think the thing that has been most difficult is that it's easier to measure stuff from you know, floating around in the serum. Uh, but what we and, uh, and basically one other group has found most critical is to look inside of cells and tissues, which is a little harder. So uh, what we've been trying to pioneer, I didn't have a chance to talk about, uh, is looking inside of the blood cells instead of, uh, instead of the serum. And so you can see little fluctuations in the serum and you'll see a lot of papers claiming that there is or isn't uh, moderate changes in oxidized cholesterol floating through the serum, but where you see the massive changes is inside of blood cells. And uh, there's, there's a paper, and we've, we've repeated, we haven't pu uh, published it yet, but we've repeated the, the results from this, this publication out of a group in, in Taiwan, uh, where they see that like a 60-fold increase in 7-keto cholesterol inside of the blood cells of heart failure patients. Uh, compared to controls. So it, it should be a, a test that, uh, that we're all getting uh, in our lipid panels. It is a little challenging though, because you have to extract from the blood cells and do mass spec to accurately quantify it. So it, uh, it's, it, right now it's a bit uh, expensive and time consuming of, a, uh, uh, of an assay to do. Okay, and are these compounds, uh, maybe you mentioned it, are they administered intravenously or orally, the cyclodextrins? A good question, and I, and I should have mentioned that, that uh, cyclodextrins are notoriously not orally available. Uh, if you eat them, they're fiber, uh, and so you pass them quickly, and so they have to be injected. Okay, 
And two related uh, questions. Um, is there any data showing the effects on animals or people who have been previously treated with statins? And is there any data regarding statins and seven keto cholesterol levels? Uh, let, let me take the, uh, the second question first, which uh, statins and seven keto cholesterol levels. Um, it, it, very tentatively, it looks like it, higher cholesterol is correlated with higher oxidized cholesterol uh, in, in animals and humans. Uh, and so if you have people with hypercholesterolemia, uh, they tend to have high, very high uh, oxidized cholesterol in their blood cells. And, uh, and it, it looks like if you lower that, you can modestly decrease the amount of oxidized cholesterol. Now, has this been tested uh, you know, to, uh, in, in, in humans with, uh, you know, with cyclodextrin-based drugs or, or anything like that? Uh, no, but um, we are certainly planning to introduce our drug with standard of care uh, with cholesterol lowering uh, drugs as uh, uh, you know together, so uh, that will be the prevention, and our drug will be the cure. Excellent. Well, super exciting news. Okay, that's that's great. 